being here in person. Um, there's just something different about it. And, and I'm really happy that we have the online option, but there is just, if we can be here in person, there's something more to it. So it's just really good seeing you guys face to face. I, I don't know what kind of week you've had. Um, some of you probably good, some bad, some maybe even horrible, but today is just, I, I, I really feel like the Spirit's going to be working to, for us to remind us of what we're on this earth for and to remind us that we have hope in, in Jesus. So I just want to read to you a passage that, that I was reading this morning to remind us of that. And this is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and it's just verses 16 through 18. It says this, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentarily, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You might not see Jesus physically here today, but he is here. And he has so much in store for you and me. Let's pray and we'll start to worship him. Father, you are so good. And we are reminded of that in what your son Jesus did for us. And because he is risen, in him we are risen too. It's in his name we pray and we are so thankful. Amen.
he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The word that John is speaking about here is Jesus. And as he just said, in the beginning of time, Jesus already was there because he is God. Nothing in all of creation was created except through Jesus. He's before it all. He's above it all. And that's exactly what we're about to be singing. We've sung this song a few times here in the past month, um, simply saying that Jesus is over everything. It's worthy of all praise because he has the name that is above every other name, the name that at which every knee bows, every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so I want to invite you as we continue in our worship, let's put him above everything, above every circumstance we may be facing in our lives, whether it's things at work, maybe it's sickness, relationships. Jesus is greater. He was before all of those things, and he will be here long past all of those things have faded. And so let's give him glory. Let's give him praise. Let's give him honor and his do his name. Would you join with us as we continue this morning?
surrendered heaven The veil was torn in two You gave us your spirit Now we are close, closer than we think Creation is groaning Longing for the unseen Closer than we think What are they singing? What is it like? You are surrounded with thunder and light Everything in us The longing, the ache To join with the heavens The anthem of praise Holy
God, you are holy. You are mighty. You are so far beyond us. Jesus, you are over everything. There's no one higher, no one greater. Because you are God. And Jesus, we're amazed at how you came and you walked among us. How you chose to go up on that cross and bear the weight and burden of our sins. And how you said it is finished. Jesus, you took away the curse, you took away our sin, our guilt. It is by your blood that we are made clean. We are made pure, we are made holy. And you are holy, holy, holy. And we, we join with all of creation, all the saints, the elders, all those in the throne room singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Father, we're amazed at how you've loved us. We praise you and we say every bit of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. It's really easy for me to remember Jesus when I stand there and sing about him. Holy is the Lamb. It's really easy for me to remember what life is about when I stand in here with you guys. But during the week, I lose it. Whether it be work and the distraction of that or whatever's happening in the family, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Or, or maybe the car breaks down or maybe something goes wrong with the house. I forget what I'm here for. I, I forget what it means for me that, that he gave his life for me that his blood was poured out for me. I forget of who I am in him. And so when we come to communion, it's this opportunity for us to remember what he did and what it means for us. But I love the simplicity of it. Bread, the wine, in our case, cracker and grape juice. But that's the thing, right? It doesn't have to be bread. It doesn't have to be wine. It doesn't have to be a cracker. It doesn't have to be grape juice to remember who he is. He made it this simple so that daily we can think about who he is and what he means for us in the midst of the car breaking down, in the midst of our house not looking right, in the midst of our kids being sick, in the midst of all of these things, he has made it very simple for us with the simple reminder that when we eat, we have the opportunity to remember that his body was given for us, that when we drink, his blood was poured out for us. So this is really important, right? We are supposed to do this together, but it's so simple. We are meant to do it on our own at our kitchen tables. We're meant to do it daily, to examine ourselves that, hey, am I living the way Jesus has intended me to because he is risen in the midst of people being sick? In the midst of things going wrong at work, am I living, remembering what he has done for me and who I am? It's an opportunity to examine ourselves daily. So I just want to read to you just Paul's instructions for us to the church of Corinth and, and to us on communion. This is uh, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, verse 23. 
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So this morning as we partake in these elements, we examine ourselves. Are we living as though we are forgiven and free? Are we living as though his sacrifice meant something for us? So this morning, I challenge us to live out who we are in Jesus and today be the new starting point for us in remembering who he is and what that means for us. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for your reminders of who you are. I need them. Daily, I need them. So Lord, as, as we partake in communion, I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for the simplicity of it. I'm so thankful to remember that your son died for us and his blood was poured out for us and that we are alive in him. And um, there's so much more to come in him because of him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to confess something that I would not normally confess to you because I want you to think that I've got it all together. Um, today's been a fairly distracting day, and it's good to be with you. Um, and so I want to just begin this morning by praying, then inviting the Lord. Um, he's been here. Uh, man, worship was good. Thank you guys for for leading us to the throne. I just want to invite the Lord into this season and, and mostly probably for me just to kind of calm things down. And so if you would just pray with me. Father, um, I love you. I'm so grateful for what you've done for us as we describe you in worship and praise today as holy. And all of the things that you've done for us, it is overwhelming. 
And Lord, I don't know what you want to do uh, today through the scripture that we are going to walk through, but uh, I want to just invite you to deal with us, to search our hearts, to convict us of sin, to lead us in righteousness. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So my brother, when I was 15 years old, had a 1975 Dodge Coronet. Now, most of you are not even going to know what that looks like. There's a, there's a small few of you who would go, oh, yeah, the Dodge Coronet. There was nothing remarkable about this car. It was, as my uh, father said, baby poo brown. And there was nothing spectacular about this car. Um, bought it from a little old lady that only drove it to church on Sundays. It had low miles. It had vinyl seats. Um, it just was a really heavy 1970s kind of car. Gas guzzler. Um, it was not quick, but it did have some engine in it. And it wouldn't go very fast off the line, but if you gave it enough road and enough straight path, you could get it up to speed, and it was, uh, it was fairly exciting. And my brother thought it was his mission in life to frighten me. And um, he was not successful. Except for one night, about midnight, he got it up to about 115 miles an hour as we were driving over a bridge at Grand Lake um, where my father lived, and um, he reaches down and shuts off the lights. The fastest I have ever been in a car. Some of you have got me beat, I know that. Ooh. But he turned the lights off, and it was terrifying. And that's kind of how I feel about today's scripture. We are flying low through the book of Ephesians. And, and it's not so much that, that I'm worried about moving quickly. Um, we do that sometimes. We, we're trying to get through three different books this summer. And we're in the, the fifth week of the book of Ephesians. We're going to cover it in six weeks. That's very, very fast. But the thing that terrifies me is that somehow you would only use Sunday morning as the time to study the book of Ephesians. It's as if you've turned the lights off going across the bridge at 115 miles an hour and you can't see what's to the left and you can't see what's to the right and you don't know what's behind you and you can't see where you're going. It is imperative for you if you're going to be a student of the word that Sunday morning is not the only time that you're looking at the book of Ephesians. There are six chapters. I would encourage you this week, beginning tomorrow, to read through the book of Ephesians again. Chapter 1 on Monday, chapter 2 on Tuesday, you, you kind of get the pattern. And by Sunday, you will have read all the way through the book of Ephesians as we finish this week. We are flying low. Don't turn the lights off so that you can't see what's around you. Don't limit all of your study to the book of Ephesians, to what we're doing on Sunday morning. You need to be digging into the word throughout the week. So, with that said, buckle up. We're going to fly low today through, um, and we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Now, here's the thing that, uh, and I've read through the book of Ephesians several times, and, and the thing that I love about Scripture is that no matter what season of life you're in, there is something different maybe for everybody each time you read it. And the beautiful thing about Scripture is that it applies to our life in every setting, in every season of life, and sometimes you get different application out of it. And so as I've read through it this time, Here's what I have seen. In chapters 1 and 2, I see Paul giving us the, the big picture. It's, it's not 30,000 foot view. It, it's, it's way beyond that. Paul is giving us the from eternity to eternity kind of view. That God has this plan that has been uh, started before we even knew about time. And it's going to continue long into eternity. And, and he's giving us this, this big overarching view that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And at the center of that is God's plan for us. God is eternal from one end to the other. From before we can imagine till after we can imagine, God is doing something amazing. What I see in the next couple of chapters is Paul beginning to kind of narrow the focus. Not only does God have this eternal plan, but God is working within time, within this temporal um, place that we are. 
That God's plan, yes, it is for eternity, but it is for now. And God rescues us and he saves us and he gives us purpose and he puts us in the church. Can I just tell you, the last couple of weeks, the stuff going on with our family, I don't know how people do life without the church. I don't know how people walk through the burdens that come with life without the body of believers, without doing life together. And I think that Paul kind of narrows the focus. It's what uh, Tyler talked about a couple of weeks ago, that we would comprehend and imagine how wide and how long and how deep the love of Christ is. And what Corey shared last week, that, that the church is there to build up the body, to honor God, and we've got to get in the game. And I think in these last three chapters, middle of chapter 4 through the end of chapter 6, Paul gets very, very personal. Paul begins to give us very practical instructions. Do you want to know how to live life? Do these things. Do you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus? Do these things. And and Paul uses some figurative language. In fact, um, we're going to look at in chapter 5, he talks about the way of God. He describes this journey as if we're on a path that that gets us to glory. And we step onto that path at the justification, at our salvation. When we we claim Jesus, when we accept Jesus, when, when we are rescued from this world and put into the kingdom of God through Christ and through what he did on the cross, that's our justification and we step onto the path. And then for the rest of our life, We are on this path, and that is the process of sanctification, where the Holy Spirit works in us to conform us to his image. And finally, the path ends in eternity when we are glorified. This idea of the path is not new to Scripture. I mean, wisdom wisdom literature, back all the way in Proverbs chapter 3. Let's see if I can fix that for you all. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and what? He will make your path straight. Jesus talks about the path that um, leads to destruction is wide and the path that leads um, to righteousness and eternity is narrow. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to look at the path that we are on. Ephesians chapter 4 beginning in verse 17. If you want to turn there. Here's what Paul says. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, verse 20 is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The path that we are on is a different path. The, the, the path that we're on is different from what the world is on. Did, did you see the strong language here where Paul says, I insist on this in the Lord. Don't live the way they live. Do you look at, look at the Gentiles? Don't live the way that they're living. You've traded all of that. Now listen, I think it's important to understand. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. He's writing to believers who were Gentiles, but who were engrafted who were adopted into the family of God. So he's not beating up these folks. The path that we're on, the ways of the world are different than the ways of God. It's a different path. It goes to a different place. And the life lived on the path that the world is on is separated from God, and it leads to destruction. And so Paul reminds us, this is not what we're about. This is not the path that we're on. When you believed, you were changed. He says elsewhere, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. It is a different path that we're on. Instead of chasing the things of this world, you are now chasing the righteousness 
and the holiness of God. There's a good chance that I'm going to offend most of you before the end of the day. Just fair warning. I'm not going to play a kazoo or anything. I mean, that's just over the top. But, but there's a good chance that Scripture is going to, to offend you at some point today. Can I just point out something? Paul didn't say when he was talking to the believers about staying on the path of righteousness. He didn't say that when we put off our old self and we take on and we clothe ourselves with Christ. He didn't say, now, I want you to go be the moral police for the rest of the world. Did you see that? We don't have any business trying to change the morality of the people who are not in Christ. It's not our responsibility. It's not our job. We have enough trouble. You're going to see this in just a minute. We have enough trouble policing our own morality. And I think the danger for the church is that somehow we have traded the, the mystery of the gospel for good action. And we think if we can just change the way people act, that we've done our job. And we have forgotten to put on Christ and to reveal the mystery of the gospel through him. I've heard many of you say, but what is this world coming to? You know what? It's coming to the same thing that it was coming to when Paul was writing this. The world is coming to death and destruction. That path leads to an eternity of grief and strife and suffering. So you've traded the old life with the new life. Look at Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. The second thing about the path is this. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of life as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. The second thing about the path that we're on is that it is defined by love. It is a different path in the world. And the definition, what, the, what marks out our path is the love of God. And he says we should be just like him. He is talking to the family of God. He's talking to the church. He says we're to follow God's example. The NIV here is not as strong. And, and so for, for those of you uh, who I love dearly, who we've stepped off and we've squared off and we've argued about, you know, which version of the Bible is the most accurate, can I just tell you that I don't think the NIV catches it quite correctly here. If you're a New Living Translation or if you're a New American Standard, congratulations, you win the prize today because what those versions say is be imitators of God. Do what he does. Look like he looks. Say what he says. Live like he lived. And, and to, to, to kind of put the icing on the cake there, he says, and God showed us how to do that because he sent Jesus to die for us. Be imitators of God. The path you're on is defined by love. I, I, I love the imagery here. Be an imitator of God. Do what he did. Did you ever take a walk with a toddler in the snow? Not the snow we get in Arkansas, although this year was pretty impressive. I'm talking about the deep stuff that, that for a toddler hits them above the knee. You know, maybe for you, grandpa, or for you, dad, it's not that deep. And, and so you go traipsing out through the snow and, and they're having difficulty and struggles. What do you tell the toddler who's following behind you? Step where I step. Put your feet where I put my feet. Because if you walk where I walk, the path is easier. God loved us so much. He demonstrated that love for us by sending us Jesus. By, by rescuing us from our sin. When we were dead in our transgressions, Christ died for us. He loved us so much. And, God says, and, and Paul says, we're supposed to act like him. Our path is defined by love. And it's not a new thing, is it? Jesus is teaching and a couple of leaders come up to him and say, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus very quickly responds, it's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your, sor all your soul, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus said it better than I did, but he wrote it. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And the second commandment is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The path that we're on is defined by love. The third thing I want you to see is in Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 8. 
It is a different path. It's defined by love. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. The path is a different path. The path is defined by love. And the path is well lit. It is easy to see in Christ the straightness of the path. In 1 John 1, um, he tells us that God is light and in him there is no darkness. In God, all things are revealed. When, when God comes into the situation, he illuminates everything. John chapter 1 describes Jesus as the light of all mankind. That light took on flesh and he dwelt among us. He reveals all things. And there is a consistent theme and an analogy throughout Scripture that things that are in the light are good. And that which is done in secret in the darkness is evil. I want you to think about that for just a minute. Parents. Parents of teenagers or, or older than that. Maybe you've said the same thing I said because I learned it from my parents when I was a teenager and we would argue about curfew. But all my friends are staying out past midnight. And my mother would say to me, son, you know what is it? Nothing good happens past midnight. Looking back on my life, that was fairly true. Isn't it interesting that, that all the bad things you ever did probably happened at night? I mean, there were a few. We did set the neighbor's field on fire with fireworks in the middle of the day, but it wasn't near as pretty as it would have been at night. Uh, uh, the bad things happen at night under the co cover of darkness. That's when, that's when the sin is easiest because we don't get caught, because we think we're hiding it, because we think we're covering it up. And I want you to think about the sins that you struggle with the most. Uh, 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 for those sins, are they the ones that you're willing to do in front of other people? You openly lie to your people. You rob a bank in the middle of the daytime. That's how you get caught, right? Think about the sins that you struggle with the most. And probably, if you're like me, there are those sins that nobody else can see. It's why Jesus said things like, if you even look lustfully at a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. If, if you call your brother a fool, you've committed murder in your heart. Do not worry. Are you hiding sin in secrecy? And here's the thing. That's why sin is so shameful. Because we think we're getting away with something and then we get caught. Isn't it embarrassing when you get caught in the middle of sin? Several years ago, I was driving down the road and uh, I didn't realize it, but my tag had expired. But thankfully, there was a Fort Smith police officer who pulled me over to remind me that it was time for me to go down and pay my $27 or whatever. The problem was he pulled me over as I pulled into this parking lot. So all of, I don't know what was going on on that, that, that Thursday, but every person in our church had to drive past us, and I, there I was. I, you know how embarrassing that is? Oh, I see you got caught. What would you do? It was a tag. Or the time that I got the ticket in the church van, mm -hmm. and he said, where do you work? I said, Central Christian Church. He said, what's the address? I'm like, it's on the van. That's why we don't put the address and the name on our church vans. <laughs> it's a decision that I made. Sin is shameful, and it happens under the cover of darkness when we can hide it. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. In Christ, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men so that others may see your good deeds and glorify their Father. Here's the interesting thing about being the light of the world and living as children of the light. We don't make the light. When I was a kid, um, this will date me. Some of you will agree with this, and some of you who are growing up in this time, I, 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 I'm sorry that you're missing out. But um, we would buy cereal based on the toy 
based on the prize that was in the box. So they still do that because we buy bags here. We buy it a bushel at a time and they don't have prizes in that. Um, I, I don't even know what the name brand stuff tastes like anymore. It probably doesn't even taste right. We've had so much of the, the, the bag stuff. But when I was a kid, um, my mom would get the Tony the Tiger cereal and, and we would get the prize on it. You remember when you were young and, and all of the glow-in-the-dark stuff started to come out? You, you'd open up that cereal box and you'd pull out this little plastic Tony the Tiger and it's like, hey, it glows in the dark. Yes. And you run into the closet and nothing. And then you start figuring out, oh, we've got to hold it up to the light. And then you run in the closet. Ah, Tony the Tiger is glowing in the dark. Yes. And you know what? Tony the Tiger only glows so long. And then you got to put him back in the light. You are the light of the world, but if you are not connected to the source of light, the glow goes away. How often are you digging into Scripture? How often are you meditating on His Word? How often are you spending time just fellowshipping, communing with the Lord? in prayer. If you stay in the light, you'll continue to reflect back that light. You'll continue to glow, and God gets the glory for that. You are children of the light. The path is well lit. You're now in the light. Why would you go back to the darkness? The fourth thing, it is a different path. It is defined by love. It is well lit. Look at Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15. Paul says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The path that we're called to has lots of opportunities. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. There's, there are opportunities along this path for us to be obedient, to know the Lord's will, to spend time with him, to understand his ways. That is called worship. There are opportunities on this path for us to interact with outsiders, and they may not be on the same path as us, but they cross paths with us. And Paul says, make the most of every opportunity. This sounds like Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, where he says, um, uh, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. This is an evangelistic kind of opportunity. There's also opportunities in the body of believers on this path. When Paul says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, it changes our relationship. Because for me, if I'm going to submit to you, if I'm going to yield and give way to the needs that you have, it means that you are more important than me. And if you're doing the same thing, I'm more important than you. And all of a sudden, we're more concerned about meeting the needs of other people than we are about getting our own way. And when we are a church that submits to one another out of reverence for Christ, ministry comes easy. He goes on to say, and you can read this one, this also works in the family, this idea of submission. Husbands, love your wife. That is a submissive stance. Wives, submit to your husbands. Clearly, Submissive stance. And here's what works in my home. If my wife is more important than me and I am more important than her, guess what? We both get our needs met and God is honored by that. The path you're on has opportunities for worship, for evangelism, for ministry in the body. So how do we apply the scripture? What's next? What do you do with the path that you're on? Several years ago, Andy Stanley, he's a, a, a guy I like to read. Um, I like to listen to his sermons. He just has insight in a, in a way that's just meaningful for me. He wrote a book entitled The Principles of the Path. 
And, and I'll give you just a quick rundown. Um, the, the principle of the path is that the decisions that we make today will exponentially affect the path that we're on the further we get from this decision. Small decisions today make big course corrections down the road. And um, parents, if you're uh, looking for something to maybe walk through with your um, older elementary student or even high school student, this is a great book because it talks about the decisions that we make now, even as, as teenagers, even as, as, as adolescents, that those decisions will affect our life 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. The premise is that we make decisions now so that we go where we want to go down the road. And we know that the wrong path leads us to destruction. But here's what he says. We begin selling ourselves on what we want to do rather than what we ought to do. And then we listen to ourselves until we believe our own lies and then we opt for happiness. Here's the deal. There are only two options for the path that you're going to be on. There are only two options. The first one is that you can walk in the way that God created for his glory and for our benefit, or you can go the way of the world, which leads to destruction. And here's the scary thing. Brothers and sisters, here is the scary thing. That some of us think that those paths are parallel to right at the very end. That somehow I can put one foot on the path that leads to eternal life and I can love the Lord and I can go to church and I can sing the songs and I can be involved in all the ways of God and then I can keep one foot on the path of this world because it is a little bit fun. And how can I share the gospel if I don't, you know, hang out with lost people? How can I do the things of God if I'm not still kind of in? And we think that somehow these paths are parallel and we can keep one foot in one path and one foot in the other. The paths go different directions. It is impossible to walk on the path that leads to destruction and walk on the path that leads to eternity. You cannot do that. We started in Ephesians 4, verse 17. We ended in Ephesians 5, verse 21. And I left out a lot of scripture in between. Some of you Bible students, you're feeling it in your chest. You're already tightened up and you're anxious and you're going, surely he's not going to end there. No, I'm not. Because Paul gives us some mandates for the path we're on. It is different it is defined by love. It is well lit and it is full of opportunity. But in those verses, hear me now, this is going to get really, really personal for you. In those verses, there are 45 mandates as I read it. 45 different things that you are supposed to do or that you are supposed to stop doing. 45 different things that he gives us that are, that are mandates for us as we walk the path of righteousness and so what I want to challenge you to is that you would start this week, and we're going to go through all of them. Buckle up. You want to talk about flying low, but I'm going to turn the lights on for you so you can see where we're going, so you can see what's on either side of you. Stop trying to straddle the paths. Here are the mandates. Number one, do put off falsehood. Number two, do speak the truth. Do not sin in your anger. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry. Do not let the devil have a foothold. Do not steal any longer. Do work with your hands. Do something useful. Do share with those who are in need. Do not use unwholesome talk. Do build others up according to their needs. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do get rid of bitterness. Do get rid of rage. Do get rid of anger. Do get rid of brawling. Do get rid of slander. Do get rid of malice. Malice is one of my favorite sins right now. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, malice is thinking that or, or wanting bad things for other people. Just this week, I shared with a couple of different people who were just like, man, this guy is just driving me crazy. And I said, isn't it great when you take somebody to God and you go from praying about them to praying for them? That's the difference between 
malice and righteousness. God, I just want you to take that guy out. That's malice. God, restore our relationship. Give me the opportunity to show them love. That's righteousness. Do be kind. Do be compassionate. Do forgive each other. In fact, the qualifier there is just like Jesus forgives you. Do walk in the way of love. Do not dabble in sexual immorality. In fact, what Paul says is there shouldn't even be a hint of it. If your social media is throwing stuff up, get rid of it. If the movies you're watching dabble in sexual immorality, get rid of it. If you're trying to straddle the path, guys, this is one of the gods of this age. Stop dabbling in, in sexual immorality. Stop it. There is a proper place for those things within the context of marriage. Do not allow impurity. Do not succumb to greed. Do not use obscenity. I'm going to get really personal, fellas. Do not speak foolishly. Do not make coarse jokes. Locker room talk is inappropriate for the believer. Do give thanks. Do not be deceived by empty words. Do not be partners with the world. Do walk in the light. Do find out what pleases the Lord. Do not have anything to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Do expose the fruitless deeds of the darkness. Do be careful how you live. Do make the most of every opportunity. Do not be foolish. Do understand the Lord's will. Do not get drunk. Do be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs. I can't wait for this one to happen. Hello. Do sing and make music in your heart, which is a better place, clearly, for me to do that. Do always give thanks to God for everything. I don't know if you notice this, but in the 45 mandates in these verses, giving thanks is in there twice. In fact, what he says, give thanks to God for everything. Everything. Well, what about, what about sickness? Yes, give thanks to God for sickness because you're going to get to watch him work. Well, what about hardship? Absolutely give God thanks for hardship. Do submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, not because I deserve it, not because you deserve it, but because Christ calls us to honor him that way. Church, friends, 45 different things. I would just speculate that all of us in this room have one of these we've got a problem with. Some of you, I mean, you're setting the curve. You got like 15 or 20 of them. I've heard your jokes. You've listened to mine. It's time for us to stop straddling the path. Pick one. Pick two if you're ambitious and commit those to the Lord this week. It is time for us to move squarely onto the path that leads to righteousness. And if we'll do that, if we'll commit these things to God, I bet you that our path will be a little bit straighter. It'll be a little bit brighter. And it'll be a lot less burdensome. Let's fix this. Let's travel the path of righteousness for the kingdom's sake.
that Tim gave of the 
the glow-in-the-dark toys just as they would lose their ability to shine when they are out of the light, so do we. We gotta stay connected to the word of God. We gotta stay connected to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. And what we're doing right here is a big part of that, gathering each and every Sunday morning However, if that's the only time that we're getting in the Word, if that's the only time that we have our attention fixed on Jesus, fixed on the cross, come Saturday, we're getting pretty dark. I want to encourage you each and every day, spend time in the Word, spend time encouraging one another through fellowship, spend time in prayer, These are the things that keep us connected to that source of light. And just as Tim said, let's be imitators of Christ. Let every bit of who we are be fashioned after the image of what we we see in Jesus. He is the source of life. He's given us new life because of his blood poured out for us, his body broken for us on the cross. And so let's live each and every day as such. So as we prepare to to leave this place, I do have a couple of of quick announcements. Tonight, if you are... uh, in student body, or if you have a student that is 6th through 12th grade in student body, there's going to be an open gym in the Family Life Center from 6.30 to 8.30. And so uh, just make sure you're, you're, you're there, you're ready. It's going to uh, be a good time for fellowship, a good time for hanging out, a good time for, for having some fun. And then also, uh, this week is Camp Haven. So initially, this was from 2nd through seventh grade, but we have opened it up to first grade as well for registration. And today is the last day to register because it starts tomorrow and it goes through Friday this week. It's basically a a day camp here at Central and then you get to go home and sleep in your bed at night. And again, that's from first grade through seventh grade. There's going to be a rock wall, which you may have already seen over there in our parking lot. I think there's some go-karts, some laser tag, all kinds of things. And every bit of it is going to be focused on the cross, on building up our young ones in the way that they should go. So I want to encourage you, if you haven't already signed up, make sure you get in contact with Jeff today because today is the last day to register for that. Um, It's going to be a fun time this week. So with that, I will pray over us and we'll be dismissed. God, you are so good, so worthy of our praise. And it's our desire to be filled with your light, that we would turn around and be the light to the world as you've called us to be. We are your people. You are our God. We are so amazed at how you have loved us that you freed us from our sins. God, we look to you now and we continue our worship as we leave these doors. You're mighty, you're strong, worthy of all of our praise, so we give that to you now. We say this in Jesus' name. Y'all have a great week.
Thank you. 